year driven. Uh, we have a specific program that we use in our schools to collect office discipline referral data so that we can analyze it and know what patterns are in our buildings, look for areas where we need to maybe reteach specific behaviors or if it's a kid issue or a system issue, if it's a congestion in the hall issue, we can break our data down and figure this stuff out, okay? What we needed to do was to help find a way to identify those kids that sit in class, never make a sound, and inside they are falling apart because they never show up in your behavior data. They're never in the office. They never make a noise so you don't realize that they're in pain. And so we um, very, very recently, I purchased a, a, a bunch of sets of the systemic screening for behavior disorders, which is kind of a screening process a teacher can go through and identify kids that they have concerns about in their classroom. And they, there are gates that they pass through, those are scored, and then a kid passes through a specific gate into a, the next level for screening. And it kind of helps us to identify those kids that might benefit from intervention, but they're so quiet and so close that we never know that. Um, we saw that as a need for the next level of implementation. Because the, the ones that act out, we know they need help. They show us every day that they need something. With the ones that are a little more internalizing, we needed a way to find those kids. And this has been what we're kind of branching off into now to, to identify those kids. Um, very quickly, my data is attached there for you, okay? Um, the top graph, what I do with my schools is I want to look at the time that they spend dealing with problem behavior, okay? And I've got some research done in Maryland that talks about the average amount of time per office referral. If a child acts out in a manner that's big enough that goes to the office, the child loses about 10 to 20 minutes of instructional time. The teacher loses five to 10 because she's got to stop, deal with the child right at the referral center to the office. The administrator loses 10 to 20 minutes of time. So if you think about how that time adds up across your school year, that's a big chunk of time that you're losing to, to problem behaviors when you should be teaching and when that child should be in class learning. Um, I like to look at just the number of office referrals per child in each building. That's showing teachers that decrease keeps them engaged in this and wanting to improve what they're doing. The first graph on that page that you see are my schools that have completed four years of implementation. That was my first round of schools. They are my troopers. We've all grown together. Um, I had three Nettleton School District schools in there, one from Valley View, one from Brooklyn, and two Gosnell schools. Gosnell is in Mississippi County and it's, it's a two school district. Okay, very rural, and both of those schools came on in the first year, and they've continued to do this for four years with me. So those seven schools, in the second year of implementation, their office referrals decreased by 18.5% over the first year. In the third full year of implementation, which is where data, or the research tells us that's where we start to really see this kick in, it was a 33.7% decrease in office referred behaviors over the first year, and in year four, it ended up being 44.5%. They almost in four years cut their referrals in half. One of my schools, which is a junior high school, cut theirs by 68% over four years. That's huge. Um, another elementary, it was 66%. Another one was 58%. So these schools are seeing big changes in the number of kids that are going to the office. Um, and for me, it's not so much always about the numbers. I've learned to love data because of my job, but I'm a therapist. So I like the warm, touchy-feely stuff. And when my therapists grab me in the, in the buildings, I walk in to meet with my teens, and they grab me and say, it feels so much different in here. The kids are smiling. The teachers are happy. The kids feel, I mean, and I've got a great letter. I, I didn't bring it because I'd cry if I read it to you. But I've got a, a letter from one of our therapy foster care the child is placed in her home in a PBIS school and the, the change over one year to the next I mean this child was saying things like my teacher likes me I never knew my teacher would like me and she's an ADHD kid that's all over the place and she feels good in school and she's happy and she feels like they want her there that's the stuff that I like that's the stuff that I like to hear about Sorry, I digress. <laughs> my other data is uh, is on my schools that have just completed three years of implementation. It's very consistent. The only reason I brought it is because it's so similar. 
and it shows a pretty consistent uh, trend. In the second year of implementation, they dropped almost 16%, and in that third year, they dropped almost 35% in their office referrals. So that consistent decrease in problem behaviors, um, most of my schools see that on a, on a regular basis. That, and that's what the, the research tells us we will see. Um, just a little bit, side note, about state level stuff, okay? We, I don't really, other than our state advisory folks, our systems of care folks on the state level, that's my connection for state level partnership, okay? There is nothing that holds this piece together from that level, okay? Um, in states where that exists, Illinois is the state that I have partnered with from day one. They trained me, they trained my schools initially until I had the capacity to train my schools. They have a statewide network. They have over a thousand schools in that state that are implementing PBIS and that are supported. And their entire statewide project is funded through OSEP, okay, on the federal level. They're kind of a demonstration site for OSEP and PBIS. Um, they do amazing things there. They have massive statewide conferences that I have been privileged that a lot of my schools have gone to learn from those schools about how they make this work. How do they partner effectively with mental health? They don't, when she comes here, when my, my consultant comes here, blown away by the mental health involvement in our schools. She thinks that in that aspect, we are so far ahead of the game compared to other states that, I mean, she just is amazed by that. And she, she says, when Medicaid figures out what y'all are doing, you're gonna lose all that. I hope not. Um, she really feels like we have that piece going so much better than a lot of states do. Um, but on the state level, they have large partnerships of the state agencies that, that come together to govern this so that they all work in collaboration to set policies there, not just on the local level. And I think that's a really important piece. Maryland is very similar. They have a statewide network. And that is a partnership with the Department of Education, uh, Johns Hopkins for their research. They have a Shepherd Pratt, which is a huge mental health, statewide mental health center. They all work together to implement positive behavior supports in the schools because it's just, it's kind of that systems of care model, it's that approach to approaching kids differently. Um, so that's kind of how it looks when you have a big statewide network in, in, in place to help guide that implementation. What questions do you have? I can talk all day about this, so I'm gonna stop talking. One thing I'd like to add very quickly that we really aren't to the point yet um, due to our infancy into PBIS, but the data will also show you significant changes in test scores, which is what schools are interested in, as they should be. That schools that definitely have this model and have had it going for several years do see uh, increases in their test scores because, as Lori just said, she just really got into very little of the data that she has when you increase time in the classroom, then of course you're increasing time in the learning environment to increase those test scores. And um, we're really hoping to see that coming around in our data, hopefully by the end of year six, um, before this is over. The other thing that Lori had said, because it's more about herself, is her data has really convinced the superintendents in our four counties um, this next year they will be supporting about, uh, we're, we're hoping we, we meet with them next month, but every year they've done this for us. When she can show the time saved, when a principal can say, I got 120 more hours this year to work with my teachers and to work on issues in my building instead of having Johnny in here every week or several times a week, that um, when we showed them what they're saving per hour, they have been very willing to come through and say, okay, we'll add 10,000 more to your match from last year and 10,000 more. And um, the Craighead County Superintendents Association has given us so far over uh, 30,000 a year toward her salary because of the time that they're seeing it is saving in their buildings on discipline referrals. So we've been really pleased about that. And other people are hearing, Lori is also consultant to the Hot Springs School District work with them they were going to present today we were sorry they didn't come because they're doing magnificent in their work down there and um, several other and tomorrow she is having her first statewide PBIS conference and we'll be having quite a few school districts come in that are interested in this and starting to see how it can affect their school districts so we've been really pleased with the short time span we've been able 
uh, those who know about um, our cooperative agreement with SAMHSA, our first year was strictly planning, so there's been no implementation except now for four years. And um, get that up and going and have 36 school districts having the success over that short period of time we've been very pleased with. Lori, how many staff do you have to go around to the schools? Is it just you? And what's, what's the timeline from when you first start working with the school until you feel really comfortable that they've got the PBIS model down as well, far as implementation goes? On a universal level, because that's the one that we typically, they, they tend to balk at secondary and tertiary. Um, we have a measure called the benchmarks of quality, which is a self-assessment that they do. Um, we usually check that because if they, if they, what I started doing was training in around June. I would train them in Universal around June and they would implement in August, okay? Usually we would check their implementation midway through the, the spring, so around February, March, we would check and see if they had hit the marks to, to indicate they were implementing with fidelity. That would indicate they were ready to be trained in secondary tier. Um, if you're talking about all three tiers, feeling like they're all up and going well, I'd say three years two to three years. And that's if they're very diligent and work hard. Minimum of two, probably. You can get all three tiers trained in a school year. It's very, very difficult to do that. Um, it's usually more like a year and a half at least to get all three tiers trained. And the first, the fir my guess is, because the, the first tier is hitting the general population, Yes. that that's really a, a a benchmark of itself to yes. say how well is a school implemented in tier one. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and because it's so much work and because that is such an accomplishment, that's where a lot of schools stop and they get very complacent in that. Um, and I had a lot of those first year, year schools that it was well into the year three before they realized they were not implementing anything else. Even though they had been trained in secondary and tertiary, they really weren't implementing it and they really didn't understand the need and then when they had a district coach to come in and really push it with them then they kind of started oh now we see because what happens is you implement that universal level and you hit a wall mm -hmm. because you start see there are some kids that don't respond to it but we right. know they're not going to and when teachers see that they say well this isn't working look at all these kids still acting out but they don't realize all these kids who don't act out and who right. are you know, changing their behavior to, to the appropriate expected behavior. Um, so they kind of hit that wall and that's where we come in and we say, okay, remember we said you were going to hit this wall. We need to take this a step further because we need to do something now for these kids who aren't responding. We have to kind of remind them that. That doesn't mean failure, that means you're doing exactly what we think you will do. So now we need to go to the next phase. Thank you. Follow-up question about that tertiary tier, specifically yes. with wraparounds, you were talking about you have a few schools that are actually facilitating the wraparounds themselves, and just as a question, who actually does that? Is that the mental health and the school's provider, a counselor, or is it an Sometimes. administrator or a teacher? What we do is we train about three to five folks in that building to facilitate. <clears throat> um, with the changes with the state and, you know, in, increasing that, um, there are other facilitators around. It's a lot easier for the school to say, oh, there's someone else that can do that now, because it's often a counselor or if it's a child who is served by the mental health agency, that case manager is often the person that does that because they can bill for it. Um, but it's, it's finding someone in the school that has the time to sit down with mom, form the team, engage those team members, collect that initial data, get that ball rolling, which you know can be eight to 10 hour investment easy before you even get to the wraparound meeting Finding someone in the school building that has that time is hard. So sometimes they're willing to do it because the need is so great. Um, you know, it just it just depends on the school. And if the mental health person isn't capable or qualified to facilitate that, it's often the school counselor. Some of our schools, not many, but a couple of them actually have school social workers or behavior interventionists or intervention specialists or something along that line that can do that. And, you know, it, I don't want to just get off into hot springs really quickly, but that's what we're looking at with them because with safe schools and with coordinated school health, they have intervention specialists in their buildings that are going to be charged with facilitating those secondary and tertiary interventions and guiding that in each building. So they will be the ones facilitating the wraparound. And they've all been through the state academies. They are, they are on it down there, guys. I wish they were here to talk because they are doing some great things in hot springs. They really are. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Thank you. Lori.